Welcome once again to Mises Weekends. I'm your host, Jeff Deist, and this weekend, we're, uh, <laughs> it, it, this, is, this is a first for us. We're actually trying the show live. We're finishing up a, a week of Mises University here at our campus in Auburn, Alabama. We've had about 180 kids, uh, young people in our building this week. It's been a great experience. And Lou, I have to say, did you ever imagine that you would someday be sitting here talking about the 30th year of Mises University? Well, I hoped so. All right, so, yeah, and it's, of course, great, and uh, great to be on the show. Great to have this wonderful audience, and uh, let's go. Well, we had a tremendous talk earlier this week from Dr. Gary North about some of the travails of Ludwig von Mises, the person for whom this organization is named, but uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about his wife, Margaret, whom you knew for many, many years and had a, a long relationship. She lived, I, I believe, to be 99 or 100. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about Margaret? Well, when I uh, first determined that I wanted to start the Mises Institute, and I, I, I had known Mises and Margaret um, some years before that, uh, when I had the great experience of having uh, publishing entrepreneur Neil, entrepreneur Neil McCaffrey uh, of Arlington House Publishers and the Conservative Book Club, and at that time, the only publisher and distributor of libertarian and conservative books, uh, and the grandfather of, um, of Matt McCaffrey, who was a former Mises fellow and teaches at the University of Manchester, uh, called me into his office and he said, how'd you like to be Ludwig von Mises' editor? Uh, I was 23, and of course, <laughs> I was one of the great things, that, one of the great questions I was ever asked. And so uh, this was bringing back into print omnipotent government, bureaucracy, and uh, theory and history, and also the new publication of his uh, monograph, The Historical Setting of the Austrian School. So it, I, uh, I was able uh, to have dinner with Margaret and Ludwig von Mises, um, and before I mention what a great lady Margaret was, uh, Mises was exactly what you might expect. Uh, Murray Rothbard called him, called him a, a European gentleman out of an older and better era, and uh, he was, you know, beautiful manners, very dignified, very charming, um, very uh, welcoming, uh, just tremendous. Margaret, uh, as uh, Gary pointed out, was a former actress, also a playwright, play translator, and translator. Uh, very big deal in the Austrian, uh, Austro-Hungarian world of uh, theater of those days. And uh, she, all her life that I knew her, was recognizably as a great actor, as an actress. I mean, she just had a great presence in that, uh, that's what I mean by that. And, uh, and I had some dealings with her in bringing these books back into print, more so than with, with uh, Mises. So some years later, when I uh, was working at the Law and Economics Center at Emory University, uh, where I, th uh, I would become concerned that Mises' reputation uh, and the influence of the Austrian school was diminishing uh, since the years of his death. And uh, I thought, it's probably luck that I was working at a place where, the, that sort of place, and I thought, well, I could do this. So I, I, Margaret was the first person I talked to. And I took her to her favorite restaurant in New York City, which was the Russian Tea Room, a fabulous place. And uh, I, I told her about what I wanted to do, and I asked, her blessing, and I asked if she'd be the first uh, uh, chairwoman of the institute, and that was the word she wanted used. Uh, she didn't want, she didn't like the idea of it, which was just coming into vogue at that time, the idea of calling her the chair. She thought that was insulting, and and uh, so she gave me, you know, she told me that she would be very glad to do it, and uh, she was uh, a great source of wisdom, of um, uh, uh, very strong opinions. Uh, Murray Rothbard called her after Mises' death a one-woman Mises industry, and she had been that. I mean, she was really responsible for keeping his books in print, for getting them translated, and she was doing it pretty much all on her own. So uh, I wanted to help her in that, and uh, she was thrilled. And uh, whenever, whenever uh, uh, Marty and I oftentimes would, would see her in New York, she was never anything but beautifully dressed, beautifully coiffed, beautifully made up, jewelry, um, always very formal, and she just was always gorgeous when she was in her 90s. I mean, she was a very impressive looking lady. 
uh, and also uh, a lady of always very strong opinions. She never hesitated to, get, to give me her strong opinions. Um, she was very wise, and uh, it's just a, a tremendous experience to be able to deal with her, uh, to learn uh, more about Mises, to learn about what their life had been like, to learn about such uh, small things as um, Mises's uh, uh, pension from the uh, Austrian Chamber of Commerce which would have been a good deal of money before the inflation. Um, she would always get outraged when she got the monthly check in New York, and it was just about less than three dollars. So, so in, in, in American dollars, uh, uh, so Austrian inflation. Um, so the second person I asked was Murray Rothbard, and this is the only time I've ever seen this in my life. Somebody literally clap his hands in glee. Murray was just so thrilled at the idea of a Mises Institute, and I asked him if he would, if he would um, uh, run our academic, of course, Mises Institute at this, at this point was just a typewriter on my kitchen table, uh, but I asked him if he would be in charge of uh, academic affairs, and if he would you know, be our inspiration and our guide uh, in all matters, ideological and, and uh, theoretical, and uh, uh, so he was just uh, also a tremendous person to work with. Um, always, a, I mean, uh, I've, uh, many blessings in my life. One was the, 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 the uh, I'd known Murray before starting the Institute, but every day after starting the Institute until Murray's very untimely death in uh, 1995, every single day I got to deal with him, either in person or on the phone, and he was just so much fun. I mean, he just was, so funny, so welcoming, so warm, and um, didn't hurt that he was a world historic genius. I mean, one of the great geniuses of the 20th century, maybe even more than that. Um, so <laughs> I was a very, very lucky guy to deal with people like Margaret von Mises. That one time I had dinner with Ludwig von Mises, uh, talked to him on the phone several times. That was not very successful. Uh, so I always dealt with Margaret. Um, just I was able to be around giants, quite, quite an experience. Well, I think I recall you telling me something like the first time you met Mises, it was intimidating to you, his presence. Well, I, I, uh, uh, <laughs> when I saw them at the, at the, at the, at the table, I thought, you know, holy, sm <laughs> holy smokes. Because even though I had uh, dealt with them both in bringing these books into, back into print and publishing the monograph, uh, I had not met them until after that process, and uh, yeah, it was scary. I mean, it was it was uh, uh, it was scary, uh, but they couldn't have been nicer, couldn't have been more warmer or more welcoming. Uh, and you did, as, as Rothbard said, you absolutely had the feeling that you're dealing with somebody from the days of the Habsburgs. I mean, somebody from the days of when Vienna was. Uh, one of the great intellectual and cultural capitals ever to exist in the history of the world, later, of course, pretty much destroyed. Uh, but uh, um, just what a great experience. You had a very long and fruitful, both professional and personal relationship with Murray Rothbard. Uh, he certainly, he has his uh, uh, devotees and his, his fans. He has his detractors as well. What do you think is, is so misunderstood about Murray and also about his work? Well, I think, I think um, part of it is that um, I think of somebody like, say, Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman was a brilliant guy. Um, I think his economics were a problem, but he certainly was, uh, was brilliant. But boy, was he arrogant. I mean, he was and he liked nothing better than, say, a student or a fan of his asking him a question that he thought was stupid just to humiliate them. And whether that was, he seemed to get great pleasure out of that, how can you know? But uh, that was not Murray Rothbard. So Murray was very easy to approach, uh, humble. Um, and he didn't parade his knowledge, which of course, of course was, uh, I'm not sure any of us know exactly how much he knew. I mean, he was, uh, um, do so much over so many different areas. Um, I once uh, tried to tease him. I was in, a, in a, a scholarly used bookstore in New York, and uh, David Gordon was there too. And uh, so I started asking them about the various books, and of course I couldn't find 
any book that, he, that either David or Murray hadn't read and knew all about. And could point out, well, you know, on page 28, there's this great statement about X. So that was just Murray. Uh, um, and it wasn't just his vast knowledge in history and economics and uh, philosophy, political philosophy and just philosophy, period. Um, but he was an expert on sports. He loved basketball. He was a huge fan of Tarkini and, uh, and the running rebels at uh, UNLV. Um, and whatever he, he loved politics. And whatever he got into, he became a world, a world expert. I can remember uh, being with him on election eve, and he would have uh, one of his classic uh, yellow pads full of notes that no other human being could read. Uh, and you could ask him about any congressional or senate or gubernatorial race in the country, and he knew all about it. You know, what was ha what's happening in the second district of Idaho? He knew about the candidates, the issues, the real issues, uh, the special interests, the scandals. And he just, you know, he always would predict what was going to happen, and his predictions were less, success less successful than his knowledge. But uh, he just, he, he underst understood politics, and, and when it came to the Olympics, he loved especially the Winter Olympics, and, uh, but he loved the Summer Olymp Olympics too. He knew the entire history of the Olympics. If it was a sport he was interested in, he knew what, you know, every, everybody had gotten a medal in past years. What were their strengths, their weaknesses? I mean, he just, you, it just, whatever he was interested in, he became a tremendous expert, but he never paraded this. I mean, you always had to sort of pull it out of him. Um, but I, uh, I should also mention, I talked about Margaret, uh, Murray's wife, Joey, uh, who was a brilliant, uh, a brilliant, brilliant woman. Margaret once said that uh, she wished that Joe had gone on to get a PhD. She had a master's from Columbia um, because she uh, should have had a PhD. She should have been a professor and not have devoted her life to Murray. Well, um, she was always glad she devoted his li her life to Murray. And of course, Murray famously in one of his dedications called her the indispensable framework. And she was. So she was, uh, Murray was in some ways the absent-minded professor. And I can remember when she would say go sometimes to visit her family in uh, Southern Virginia, uh, uh, where both Murray and, and Joey are buried. Um, in their freezer, she would leave Murray's meals with the, you know, Tuesday lunch and Wednesday dinner and so forth. To, so, because otherwise, you know, he might not eat or whatever. So she had to, you know, that, that uh, um, she took good care of him, but and as important as that was, and she was just like Margaret typed uh, Human Action and other, other uh, Mises books. Uh, she helped Murray with that sort of thing, although he was a super typist, very, as Walter Block pointed out the other day, very, very fast typist. And he could uh, uh, really turn out the material. I'll just make a slight uh, addendum to Walter's story about Murray having to be reminded that uh, he had a paper due much sooner than he thought, and it was uh, the, uh, his New Deal monetary policy paper. So he excused himself, went into the next room, and, and as Walter said, typed it out. This is a large paper. Typed it out with footnotes and bibliography. So he'd written the whole thing in his head, but hadn't actually typed it out. Um, so <laughs> that, that always struck me as an amazing ability uh, uh, to be able to do that. And again, this is just... Rothbard. Uh, after his death, uh, Joey asked me to come and uh, um, go through his office at, in Las Vegas and see what should be shipped back to New York and what could be, what could be disposed of. And um, um, uh, it was just, you know, very, very moving. Uh, and also it just gave me a glimpse, which I'd already known about, but just a further glimpse of just how important Joey had been to him as an intellectual partner, uh, as a critic. Uh, a lot of times she would say, Murray, you, know, <laughs> you can't say that. Uh, and he, he said that a number of times she'd sort of saved him from trouble. Um, and he wouldn't always take her, his advi her advice, but um, she was very smart, very knowledgeable, very sweet, uh, and I must say a great judge of people. She, uh, I never, and she was a quick judge. I never knew when she was wrong. I mean, she, when she said, 
you know, you can't really trust that guy. It turns out you couldn't trust that guy. And when she thought somebody was a good person, well, they did turn out to be a good person. So that uh, just one of her many abilities, and she was uh, herself a, a huge expert in opera, uh, especially the operas of Wagner. She loved going to the uh, Bayreuth Festival, and, and uh, she knew everything about Wagner, everything about Wagner's music, um, and that was just one of her hobbies. Uh, but Murray was her main hobby, and of course her, her, her life's work, and uh, I think without, without Joey Rothbard, um, we would not have the same Murray, uh, absolutely. So he was very lucky uh, in their marriage, and uh, she tells the wonderful story about being late once to a date with him to go to the movies uh, uh, before they were married, and so she arrives at the theater. It's a huge theater. It's uh, pitch black, and she wonders, how, gosh, how am I, how am I going to find Murray? And then she hears his laugh. So she could go, you know... <laughs> right to the aisle and to the seat, because he had a, such a distinctive laugh. You heard his laugh all the time. He just, uh, he was definitely the joyful libertarian, but he was just a joyful person, uh, and uh, uh, not an unrealistic person, very realistic about the state, its depredations, about uh, the chances of uh, uh, victory for all of us in the future. Uh, but he just loved life, he loved the battle. He loved, of course, scholarship, he loved knowledge. Um, just uh, be able to sit at his feet was, uh, was quite an experience. Well, let's back up for, for just a minute and talk a little bit about your career prior to meeting Murray, prior to starting the Institute. A lot of people probably know that you worked for Arlington House for some years, and, and you may not know that Lou was also at Hillsdale College for a period and started uh, their publication in Primus, which still survives today. But you've told me some stories that you've been in the room with a lot of interesting people over the years. I mean, you've mentioned some names like, like Nixon and Buckley and Ayn Rand, so I'd love to hear an anecdote. Well, um, I, this, I have to tell something terrible about myself. In, in uh, the 1960 election, I was 16, and uh, I, I collected money for Richard Nixon's campaign. So, you know, I, 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 <laughs> but I raised a lot of money. I raised, I, I, in my town, my um, Boston suburb, uh, in Massachusetts, all the Republicans hated the guts of John F. Kennedy and the whole Kennedy family. So raising money for the anti-Kennedy was actually pr pretty easy. So I raised three thousand dollars. Did you go door to door? How did you do it? No, it had to be door to door. I was given a list of all the the registered Republicans. This town today is um, probably has more communists than it's got Republicans, but um, very very left wing place. In those days, it w wasn't true, so it was mostly Republicans, and I went door to door over a, a period of days, and uh, um, it, it was a different era, you know, uh, that was the era, too, where um, Avon ladies were able to be welcomed in people's homes, didn't fear to go in, <laughs> where housewives would have the fuller brush man come, can't conceive of something like that happening today. So everybody was very welcoming, and sometimes they gave, and sometimes they didn't. Um, and by the way, there were no, uh, uh, you didn't have anything like the FEC regulations. Uh, but people were very generous, and uh, they, hate, they hated Kennedy. I'm sure some of them liked Nixon, too. Um, but because of that, I got to, I got to uh, meet Nixon. And uh, so I was stationed, out, he was giving a big, big speech at the Boston Armory, and then I'm stationed uh, outside with uh, uh, this great lady, um, Mrs. Darrow, who was sort of my patron in the Republican Party, and uh, so Nixon comes running out, angry. Come on, Pat! Come on, Pat! We're late. We're late. And then she, you know, so then he shoves, shakes hands with me, and he's gone. And uh, Pat came out, and I, I thought she looked like an angel. And this was the way people dressed in those days. She had a hat, pocketbook, gloves, and so. But then she stopped and talked to me for maybe five minutes. Meanwhile, Nixon is saying, "Come on! Come on! Come on!" <laughs> so. Uh, I was always pro-Pat uh, as a result of that, but not, of course, pro-Nixon. Um, although I was followed Nixon with great interest. Uh, uh, Buckley, Bill Buckley, uh, very smart, very charming, very evil, like a serpent, a snake. Um, a very bad guy, um, ex-CIA agent. Uh, they always say with agencies like the CIA and the KGB, no such thing as an ex. 
And I think that was certainly the case of Buckley. I think he set up National Review um, or the CIA. He set it up for him. Uh, all those questions about where the money came from. Uh, the uh, lawyer who incorporated National Review was Bill Casey, who had been head of the OSS and later head of the CIA himself. Um, a lot of CIA people involved in, in uh, National Review. Uh, and also old right people. Um, John T. Flynn, for example, wrote until he was kicked out. Uh, so w why was he kicked out? He was kicked out because he wasn't pro-war and wasn't pro-American empire and wasn't in favor of nuking the Soviet Union. Um, so uh, the, the Buckley magazine was very right-wing in those early days. Um, I, I think deliberately so to try to bring the right wing along with the empire and the war, the permanent war and the Cold War and so forth, which had not been the case earlier as Rothbard, uh, the great scholar of this among so much else, uh, points out the, the uh, American right wing until then had been, for example, anti-Roosevelt. Sort of their key thing in life was hatred of Roosevelt and Truman. And uh, because of that, they opposed the American drive to war, the Roosevelt drive to war, uh, they might have felt that World War II was necessary to fight, but they weren't ever happy about it, and they didn't think that should be a model for the permanent American uh, warfare state. Um, so National Review had a huge effect in bringing uh, this along. I've been, I met Buckley a number of times. I didn't really know him well, but uh, uh, he was very charming, smart, um, but I think a, you know, a very bad guy, and all the, all the sort of right-wing stuff uh, uh, I think buttresses my view that, it, and this Rothbard's view, of course, this was a trick, uh, because once everybody in the conservative movement the, uh, of those days, the um, uh, Republican Party had been brought along to total warfare, permanent warfare, permanent empire. Uh, Buckley famously said in 1948 that uh, we had to build a uh, uh, bureaucratic state in America in order to be, uh, fight permanent war, and that everything had to be devoted to fighting on a war footing forever because you would all, Soviets would be forever, and uh, we had to turn ourselves into a garrison state, surveillance state, <clears throat> all the stuff that, is, that has since happened. But National Review dropped away all their right-wing aspects and became just a bunch of, uh, as they are today, just a bunch of sort of social justice warrior types. Um, so I think I knew Barry Goldwater a little bit, and I think I put Barry in that same category. I was a huge supporter of Goldwater. Um, uh, donated a lot of money I couldn't afford and worked my heart out for him. Uh, and it was only later that I realized that and he was always bad on foreign policy, but boy, he was great on domestic policy. Very, very libertarian. His book, Conscious of a Conservative, written, ghost written by the great uh, Brent Bozell. This is not the present Brent Bozell, but his dad. Um, who was a man of great uh, principles and great ethics, and uh, later put in an insane asylum with Buckley's help. Whether he actually was insane or who knows, Buckley didn't like uh, his brother-in-law, Brent Bozell. Um, but um, uh, Buckley just did uh, so many bad things, but he was Again, the National Review is very key to the promotion of the Goldwater movement or Barry Goldwater. Only after this all happened did I find out that Goldwater had been pretty much of a statist before he ran for president. And in fact, gave a famous speech at the 56 Republican convention that uh, Republicans had to forget the old notion of opposing the no deal, opposing the, f the fair deal, that every conservative, every Republican had to accept all of this and just move on and that it would be an outrage and reactionary and so forth to uh, continue to think maybe there was something wrong with the New Deal or the, or the, or the Fair Deal. <clears throat> After his race for president, uh, his term as a U.S. Senator from Arizona, he was just a total neocon. So, and he was a neocon, I would say, before that, so my, uh, my supposition was, has always been that the Goldwater campaign was just another trick, very successful trick, and um, but still, that book, Conscious of a Conservative, that Bozell wrote, is still very much worth reading. I mean, the prose just jumps off the page, and uh, private, you know, get rid of Social Security and TVA and all kinds of government industries, and and uh, he was entirely in favor of the freedom of association, 
in a very tough time. He voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, so he did a lot of great things. Um, can't look into his heart, but he definitely was a bad guy earlier, a bad guy later. Um, bad on foreign policy, but the, the view of those of us, very naive view probably, uh, was that Johnson was just as bad. Goldwater might have been worse on foreign policy, who can know. Um, but boy, he was, he was a great voice in the 64 campaign uh, uh, for libertarian ideas domestically. Uh, very eloquent. Just, just, so I, I would say that he had a very good effect in some ways, a bad effect in other ways. Who else did you want to, to mention? Well, I guess I'm curious after this start in your young life, is, can you identify a, a particular period or a particular time when you recall really becoming fully anti-state, anti-war? Well, I got a good start, uh, I think, because my dad was a very strong Taft Republican. And in fact, my first political memory is um, him pinning a Taft president button uh, on my coat. Uh, so I think I was always uh, oriented that way, even, even in, as, as uh, a little, little kid in school, I was troubled for my teachers uh, on these kinds of issues. Um, but I think it, you know, it took a while to develop. I was more of a conservative initially. Um, well, I can still remember, and this is before the 64 Civil Rights Act, I went to a very liberal school, and uh, I can remember this one particular teacher advocating something like the Civil Rights Act, and I just, I, uh, I was in the seventh grade, and I just couldn't, just didn't strike me as the right thing that the government should be able to tell the businessman who he should serve and who he shouldn't serve. I mean, I didn't understand why anybody had a right to be, get a hot dog at the hot dog stand if the hot dog stand owner didn't want to sell them the hot dog. <clears throat> so those days that wasn't called racism, but you know, that, that uh, it, was a, it was an unpopular view, especially in my school. Um, but I think um, the reading that my dad encouraged me to do and, and uh, uh, the kinds of people I started to read, um, working at Arlington House later, was when I was very lucky to be sort of in the, um, the f I'll say the freedom movement, it wasn't necessarily sort of the libertarian movement, um, but except for my first job, which was a writing job and was uh, in just dealing with business things, not, <clears throat> not ideologically, but um, I got to uh, um, work at Arlington House and at, again at Hillsdale College and uh, set up uh, their ideological programs and uh, so I, lear I learned a lot there, and I was editor of a libertarian uh, medical, med medical magazine of uh, uh, economic issues in medicine, um, and except on licensing questions, was entirely libertarian, and uh, worked against everything that's happened, is what I mean, you know, the, the sort of thing that, uh, and uh, warned against um, everything that's, that's coming, and uh, I must say one of the great experiences, we took a group of congressmen Probably the best known still today was uh, Phil Crane um, to London, to England to study the National Health Service. And um, we had Enoch Powell speak to us and I met a lot of great people, Sir, uh, Keith Joseph, later Sir Keith Joseph, who worked for the Thatcher administration. But uh, Enoch Powell, and then I later was able to bring him to, to uh, Hillsdale for a week. I must say, the most eloquent speaker I've, I've ever encountered. I mean, the most astounding. Uh, of course, British politicians were all, uh, tend to be very amazing on their feet. But this guy was like a Shakespearean actor, ideologically motivated. I mean, he was for the gold standard, free market, and uh, uh, just a pioneer in many different ways. And I remember having him, uh, we had him debate at Hillsdale, uh, Truman's head of the Council of Economic Advisors, about price and wage controls. It was the night was just a pouring, pouring Michigan rainstorm, and this economist had come in his galoshes and his raincoat and his umbrella and that sort of thing. After this debate, he walked out into the rain just in his suit. The rain is pouring down. He forgot his hat, his so we had to bring him back in. He was so gobsmacked uh, by what had happened to him by Powell. He just uh, it was just a <laughs> so uh, Enoch Powell and other. Tremendous man, I think, uh, predicted uh, some of the problems of mass immigration very early on, too. 
um, a very, uh, also a decentralist, a little Englander, uh, an advocate of uh, non-interventionist foreign policy uh, on the part of England, uh, to be neutral, to be, uh, uh, some people would say isolationist, to be a non-isolationist in trade and cultural matters, isolationist as to not bombing other people. And uh, so the, he was uh, also a great poet in, in ancient Greek, uh, author of a tremendous um, scholarly work of about 1,500 pages on the House of Lords of the Middle Ages. I mean, just a great intellectual. And uh, um, then, of course, like, like Jeff, uh, I got to know Ron Paul very well, another great intellectual, public, public intellectual. Um, author, uh, economist, even he's a physician, but he's an economist, he's an historian, constitutional scholar, um, great man. Uh, as we can both testify, there are a lot of people who are not what they seem. That's especially true on Capitol Hill. <clears throat> They're very different in the real life. Um, Shauna Cranston I, uh, always makes the point, and I think I agree with her, you can a lot of tell you know, how these guys treat their staff. They, they're loving the human race <clears throat> in public and they're beating people over the head who can't resist in private, right? That's the sort of the typical congressman. Uh, but Ron Paul was a gentleman and a, a sweetheart. Uh, and in, in private life with employees, with friends, with patients, um, just exactly what he seems to be in, in, uh, in his public life, that's the way he is in, in private life. Well. I'd like to turn to uh, more topical events. If there's any questions we might elicit from the crowd, I, I would certainly like to, to, uh, to a just ask you briefly uh, uh, any thoughts you have on the Democratic Convention, which just wrapped up, and Madam Hillary. <coughs> Lou, Lou doesn't like politics, but he does have something to say about it from time well, to time. You know, I, I, I don't like the effects of politics, um, but it's, I must say, I love watching it. I mean, I love. I love the scam. I love uh, I love hating these people, and and, uh, and of course it's all they do terrible things to us. So it's I think I think it's fun and important to follow them. I, I don't vote. Uh, only voted once in my life for Barry Goldwater, and that I regret. Um, but I I think um, uh, so the Democratic. I mean it was a uh, I don't know Scott Adams the Dilbert. Cartoonist says quite a wonderful blog. Uh, he's, he says he's a supporter of Hillary because he lives in California and literally his life would be in danger if he came out for Trump. So that may very well be true, who knows. Uh, but he, uh, he summed up the, um, uh, he thought that the, the, the Democratic Convention seemed to be entirely anti-male. And uh, by the, he, he thought that they Perhaps it made a mistake by just being so openly hating the guts of men. And he said, he thought by the end of the convention, uh, the men had left the building. He said, by the way, the building they built. So I'm very politically incorrect, Mr. Adams. But, um, so certainly it was a, it was a display of, um, of um, all the special interest groups, um, all, all the, uh, the grievance industry and so forth. And of course, in favor of uh, uh, more war, more government, uh, I think those who, who worry that Hillary is capable of uh, bringing about nuclear war with Russia uh, don't exaggerate. I mean, she's her temperament and her, uh, uh, if you just remember her, her uh, giggling over killing Gaddafi, I mean, her, her witch cackle, uh, as she said, we came, we saw, he died. <laughs> <clears throat> so, by the way, there were some uh, great photos you may have seen from the convention of her with her gigantic mouth open, uh, laughing, and she has a spot on her tongue, and people are saying that's the result of a biopsy to her tongue, so <laughs> who knows, but um, I think she's a very nasty piece of work. Um, I don't think she's in favor of human flourishing, and uh, because po politicians in general um, with the reception of Ron Paul, I think Ron Paul uh, is the only one that I know about or have ever encountered, I would say, maybe in all of human history, certainly in American history. I mean, even a guy like Jefferson, who was good in many ways before he was in office, 
uh, great in many ways after he left office, but terrible when he was in office. Um, uh, just, uh, of course, this is the history of presidents. Not one of them has ever left uh, the government smaller than he found it. Even the ones who are, who are decent, um, Harding, um, uh, Cleveland, certainly decent as compared to the other ones. Although my, my favorite, somebody asked me the other day who my favorite president, and I said, oh, it's William Henry Harrison, because he died right after being inaugurated. So he, he didn't actually do any damage as president. Do we have uh, questions from the audience, though? I think we have a question over here. I know uh, Ron Paul and Murray Rothbard have always been pretty optimis optimistic about our future and, and libertarianism and Austrian economics, but I was wondering what you think about the, the rise of um, socialism and uh, um, new, new Keynesian economics, whether uh, after a financial crisis, if that, the current system is just going to be replaced with the same system. Well, I think, I think socialism never went away. Uh, certainly the name has gotten a lot more prominence, Piketty and, uh, of course, Bernie. Um, and, uh, but the U.S. system has always been, more, for a very long time, and partly socialist. Um, but I think, that, I think that Murray and Ron have a point. Um, we are right. I mean, we do have the truth on our side. That, ha that has to count for something. Obviously, the truth can be crushed has been crushed, um, but it somehow always bounces back. And I think even from a, a religious standpoint, we know that uh, in the end, things are going to be okay. And I think even in terms of human society, uh, Rothbard always thought that, that um, the truth would eventually, uh, would eventually triumph and that uh, human flourishing would count and that, we, uh, you know, that uh, there was no going back he thought and certainly hoped in terms of the division of labor, because of course if there were, there'd be mass global starvation among other, other effects of that. So he thought that we were making progress. I think uh, uh, we see it here at this Mises, Uni Mises University week. Uh, and I think, uh, I must say I thought it was a very low point after 9-11 when it seemed like, um, because government, every state would like to be totalitarian. Every state would like to be the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany. The only thing they don't like about the Soviet Union, it didn't give a very good life to the rulers. So that was, you know, a problem. Uh, uh, I remember that um, uh, uh, there was an incident towards the end of the Gorbachev era where there was a communist, par a local communist party leader whose, whose car, which of course only very few people had cars in those days, was in a car accident, and the trunk of his car popped open and it was full of sausages. And the, the people who were surrounding there were so outraged that this guy had sausages, which of course were not, were not exactly available to the regular person, they beat him up. And uh, Yuri Maltsev, who was a, a, a Soviet economist, defected, one of the last defectors uh, here, and, uh, one of our senior scholars, uh, said he thought that when, that, uh, when being a member of the power elite meant you got sausages versus not, uh, that's pretty, pretty small. So uh, I, think, I think the whole regime of evil all over the world, they don't want to go back to pure socialism because they don't have a good life. Uh, so they really like fascism better, which is economically more viable. Um, so we have that to fight. Um, but I think, I don't know, I think people want change. I think people are dissatisfied with the political arrangements, whether that's true in England or on the continent. You know, all of, all of human history, there's been a, a race between power and market in Rothbard's terms. And uh, sometimes we seem to be winning, sometimes we seem to be losing, but again, we have the truth on our side. And I think, uh, uh, unlike right after 9-11, um, I think a lot of Americans especially distrust the government. They don't, the, the polls show this, they don't like the government. Now that doesn't mean that they're you know, able to reject some new scam that Hillary or whatever is going to offer them. But I think, I think uh, there's a lot to be optimistic about, about young people. I think a lot of young people um, don't like what they're being taught in college ideologically. They don't like the atmosphere on campus. 
They don't like their professors who uh, might as well have a flashing sign on their forehead saying fraud, fraud, or liar, liar. And uh, so they're looking for something else. We can help provide them with that something else. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, I think uh, the fight for human flourishing uh, has always been a struggle. But uh, we really have made progress. And uh, many things threaten us. Um, in so many different ways, but I, I, I think Ron and Murray, uh, who are close friends, and um, um, uh, I think they're right. So I think, uh, obviously I'd like to believe they're right too, but I think, I think they're right, but that doesn't, you know, this is not anything easy. It's gonna require all of us, work from all of us, uh, require scholarship, Everything comes from scholarship. Uh, you have to have intellectuals. Um, that's something probably wrong with the Trump effort. There are no intellectuals involved. So it's all just sort of seat of the pants. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong. Um, so the rule of intellectuals, of academics, is absolutely essential to everything. As, of course, great entrepreneurs, great managers, great professionals, doctors, lawyers, so forth. There are many like Shauna who are, would always give you a five, but uh, lawyers are still important. Uh, Jeff, even Jeff wouldn't always give you a five. He's an attorney too, of course. Um, so it's, uh, um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm in Rothbard's terms, a short-term pessimist, a long-term optimist. So. Another question out there? Um, what are your thoughts on the recent pages of the 9-11, uh, Congressional 9-11? 28 pages? Yeah. Well, I think it's, I think they, obviously they should be released in the, uh, the, <laughs> the typical of the, of the government, right? We're going to finally release these pages, we're going to make it all public. So you look at it and everything's still redacted or blacked out so you can't, can't see it. But I think uh, clearly, um, I, I, I must say I don't, in some fundamental sense, I think there's something wrong with the whole 9-11 report. It's kind of my attitude for the Kennedy assassination. I don't entirely know what happened. I don't believe the Warren Commission. So I don't know what happened in 9-11, but I don't believe the government. I think there's something fundamentally wrong with the government story. Is it simply that they're um, hiding their own incompetence? Is it more than that? Uh, I don't know. But um, that was definitely just because it's benefited the government, and they, they should all celebrate 9-11 as a, as a holy day for them, because of course it just meant vastly, uh, vast expansion. As I mentioned earlier, every government wants to be totalitarian. They can't get away with it because of popular opposition. When that opposition shrinks, which is what happened in, on 9-11, opposition to government growth, government surveillance, police state, uh, all that pulled back. Everybody was terrified. That's why they loved, of course, frightening people all the time. Uh, so when that pulled back, the government all of a sudden expanded. And uh, as I say, they should all be, uh, they sh should all, I'm sure they do in their hearts, they do celebrate it, that this was a great, and they certainly would think the uh, sacrifice of 3,000 people is just a, a nothing. They're happy to kill people. It's something always important to remember about people who rise to the top of the government, uh, whether it's in the military or in any other part of the government, they tend to like killing people. They tend to enjoy, and see this with Hillary, they tend to enjoy sending young people out to kill or be killed. Uh, they get a charge out of it. Uh, these are not nice people. Uh, they're happy to step on other people. They get a charge out of you know, putting you under their thumb and doing that. Uh, so that's something else actually going for us. Um, most people aren't like that. Most of us don't actually want to run our next door neighbor's life let alone the next town or the next country. We're just trying to run our own lives, take care of our own responsibilities. Uh, that's quite sufficient. But of course, there are people who run, want to run the next door neighbor, the next door town, the next country, the whole world. And uh, they're a very, very nasty bunch. And uh, they, may, you know, they pretend to care about other people. We're all just means to their ends. Uh, this is the era of, uh, you know, I think, uh, narcissistic personality disorder has always, has always been 
uh, widespread among politicians and bureaucrats and everybody who seeks power, but it just seems maybe it's not any more widespread today than it, than it has been in the past, but boy, it sure seems like it. Um, and uh, everybody's a means to their end. We're all just sort of, only they are the real people in, in the world and everybody else is sadly out of focus and a means to their end. Uh, we don't feel that. We think everybody's a means to their own ends. And uh, we're not interest, interested in killing people. We're not interested in running their lives and uh, jailing them, putting them in cages, uh, ruining their lives because they smoked a joint uh, or committed some other made-up government crime. Um, so I, I, this also gives me optimism. The opposition, they really are an extremely bad bunch. And uh, so we're not, needless to say, angels. Uh, but we really are, as, as a group, as an ideological movement, a much better bunch of people. Um, and I think that's appealing to other people, because I think most people are pretty decent. Uh, it's just that they, they f f find themselves uh, having more to do, just mowing the lawn, going to church, raising their children, working in their job, um, caring for their home, um, their family. That's sufficient. It's, it's our job. Uh, to convince enough of them to go along with us, um, and we don't need everybody. I mean, it's never, we, every, everything that's accomplished in these sorts of matters, uh, for good or for ill, is by a, a dedicated minority, whether it was communists in, in, the, in, in old Russia or libertarians today. Um, it's always the dedicated minority. So we need more people, we need more dedicated people, we, we need more educated people. Um, the great Albert J. Nock was once asked about, uh, by somebody he thought of as sort of a Babbitt figure, well, you know, what, uh, what are you, you going to do to save the world? That wasn't the exact question, but that was the import of it. And Nock said, the only thing I can do for the world is present it with one improved unit. You just have to first improve yourself. And in our world, that means educating yourself. So uh, it's, a great, it's a great thing the Mises Institute does exactly as Mises wanted us to do. Uh, it's not just a matter of training economists, although that's absolutely essential. Uh, but economics is for everyone. It's for, uh, because it's really, as, as he put it, the pith of human life. Uh, and also, if you know some economics, they can't, the government can't fool you. The media can't fool you. Uh, so teaching people about the ideas of liberty, about Austrian economics, is uh, a huge blow for everything good in the world. And, um, I think, uh, again, we've got the truth on our side. The enemy is uh, a bunch of uh, monsters. So uh, it's like a zombie movie. We'll see, we'll see who wins out. I think we can win. So. Well, on that note, we are out of time. Lou Rockwell, thank you for joining Mises Weekends. Thank you, Jeff. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.